Okay, this is just a brief wrap up of the end of chapter 15, Theories of Social Behavior, Postmodernism. So in class, we talked about technologies of surveillance, how we're basically, as technology continues, they find new ways to surveil us. We're surveilled in many, many ways. Um, simulations as, you know, models or reproductions and that reality becomes, or they, these simulations become more real than reality themselves. And then hyper-reality, right? Or a hyper-real world where reality has been reproduced. So simulations of reality replace reality itself. Okay, we talked about some of the origins of postmodernism and its impact in the culture, in the art world, on architecture, all sorts of stuff, and of course the impacts on sociology. And then we talked specifically about one of the most prominent postmodern theorists, Baudrillard, and his, you know, arguments of simulacra, hyperreality, some of these terms that are really important to understanding postmodernism. <laughs> I think this picture on the slide is really the best way to understand this this concept where, you know, what is a fish becomes a Swedish fish Oreo right within a couple stages um, so that what the thing is based on, the image is based on, doesn't represent at all the reality of the initial sign that it is meant to reflect or the basic reality. So we talked about this a bit. And then we went into his specific critiques and some of his use of, of Marxism and some of his critiques of Marxism. Um, we talked about, you know, his uh, theoretical orientation. And then we left off here talking about, we did that activity about Mouse, right? And, um, you know, his letter to the New York Times about like, should Mouse be considered a uh, fiction in a world of David Dukes that already try to act as if the Holocaust was fiction. Obviously, it's a comic book where, <laughs> you know, the Nazis are cats and, and the Jews are mice. But still, you know, he painstakingly researched it for many years. So we talked about this kind of distinction between, you know, what is true and what is false, what is real and what is not real. And I brought up the Fox Dominion lawsuit, right, the idea that they settled and admitted that they lied but they drew the line in admitting on air to their viewers that they lied. So why does that kind of distinction matter in a postmodern world, right? And especially in a polarized media environment, they're really afraid that if they call out the lies that their viewers will then just go to Newsmax or other more conservative outlets, um, and that could affect their bottom line or profits. So again, if you think about that in a postmodern world, isn't news supposed to just tell us the truth? Well, what is their truth, right? What is their simulacra of truth in a way as they're representing themselves in a very specific way. So anyway, moving on finally <laughs> to where we left off with Judith Butler and her approach to, um, you know, intellectual influences and core ideas. So Judith Butler is someone that, um, kind of interchangeably, if you notice like that I'm changing pronoun usage, um, it's because she has like a she, they, pronoun usage. Um, but anyway, just in case you're like, what, why are you jumping around like that? So Butler wrote the postmodern classic Gender Trouble in 1990. If you haven't read it, you got to read it. It was meant to be a critique of heterosexual assumptions within feminism, but it really turned out to be more about gender categories and the ways that gender functions in society to control us all, right? So um, first, you know, there was this argument about the categorization of women. So Butler rejects categorizing women and criticizes feminists for perpetuating sexism by following traditional binaries, right? So sex and sexuality are socially constructed. So for instance, what it means to be a woman does not remain the same from decade to decade. The category of woman can and does change, and we need it to be that way. Politically, securing greater freedoms for women requires that we rethink the category of women to include those new possibilities. So the historical meaning of gender can change as its norms are reenacted, refused, or recreated. So we should not be surprised or opposed when the category of women changes or expands or differs than it did from previous generations. So for instance, when the category of women expands to include trans women, we should not be opposed or surprised to that. In, in Butler's view. And since we are also in the business of imagining alternate futures of masculinity, we should be prepared and even joyous to see what trans men are doing to the category of men. So 
Also, Butler talks about gendered subjectivity and gendered performativity. This is so important. And again, if you've taken any sort of gender class, you've gone through this. Um, so an individual is always in a state of contextually dependent flux and is never exclusively male or female. Performativity is the sustained continual nature of gender performance. So performativity contests the very notion of a subject and it reflects culturally sustained temporal durations. So basically, Butler says that gender is a kind of persistent impersonation that passes off as real, right? So gender is something that you do. It's not something that you are. So it's something that you perform for one another. It's something that you inhabit in a space and a time for a duration as, as you know, as the, as the uh, culturally sustained temporal duration definition says, right? So gender is something that we enact in, you know, what we wear, how we dress, how we style our hair, all sorts of things in our lives. We've, you know, are really just gendered performativity. It could even be, you know, what kind of smell you wear on your body, what, you know, how you walk, how you talk, what kind of food you eat, what kind of car you drive, right? So much of our lives is creating the binaries that we think exist normatively or naturally in society. So basically, as Butler would say, we're changing ourselves to fit the binary by oftentimes a very socialized, rigid gender performance that keeps us within those binary categories, right? But just as gender can be a place to you know, um, kind of accept social value systems. It can also be a place of resistance. It can also be a place to push back and change. So Butler also brought us new understandings about queer theory. So queer theory is a school of theory that emerged from gay and lesbian studies. And queer theorists view all sexual behaviors and identities to be socially constructed, right? So this idea that heterosexuality is normative and natural, you know, queer theorists are saying, is it? Right. If we say that anything but heterosexuality is not, quote unquote, natural, right, then why does it happen in nature? Why are there many animal species that actually engage in same sex sexuality? Right. So kind of pushing back against these things and again, looking at how do we know something socially constructed? Has it changed over time and is it different culture to culture? So that's a mark of how we know something is socially constructed. And with, with our understandings or definitions of sexual categories, we can understand that they're socially constructed. So queer theory states that people should not necessarily define themselves according to binary norms. Since gender is not fixed, nor is sexuality, it can be multiplied. So instead of demanding the abolition of gender, right, I think that's kind of the fear that people have as, you know, we've been pushing back on the notion of a binary of gender and more people are, you know, gender fluid or non-conforming or, you know, non-binary or trans. There's this kind of fear in the culture. We're just going to get rid of gender. It's like, no, I don't think we're going to get rid of gender. What queer theorists would say is we can instead seek the multiplication of gender, meaning more expansive understandings and categories. So queer theory originated from gender studies and studies of gays and lesbians in the 1980s. And Judith Butler transformed this derogatory con connotation of queer, of the term queer, that used to be used as a slur against, you know, uh, people with more marginalized sexualities, and concluded that all categories of normative and deviant sexualities are social constructs. So Butler took that word back and used it in a way to kind of understand actually pushing this notion of queering something, meaning to kind of change the, the social understanding that we have about something, to skew it, to kind of often make it more expansive and more inclusive, right? So, you know, basically what Butler's arguing there is that the connection that we have in the kind of assumptions in our culture between gender and sexuality really underlie the way that we can understand it in a theoretical sense. So, you know, basically Butler says gays are not discriminated against because of their failure to perform heterosexuality. It's much more about gender norms. And in the same way, homosexuality threatens to destabilize our understandings of heterosexuality, which is what then in turn, you know, is connected to our gender definitions of what it means to be a man or a woman. So gender and sexuality are so intertwined in the ways in which we define and understand them. 
And so queer politics is really challenging gender norms and these, you know, binary expectations of sexuality and celebrating more transgression. So the heterosexual matrix is another important concept. So the normative in which quote unquote proper men and quote unquote proper women are identified as heterosexual is that heterosexual matrix, right? Basically the power system in society that says this is what is hegemonically normal. So Butler's arguing that gender is constructed through a heterosexual matrix where gender and sexuality then become inextricably linked. So she defines her use of the term as being a grid of culturally intelligibility through which bodies, genders, and desires are naturalized. So the three components of the heterosexual matrix are sexuality, sex, and gender. For example, if I am born female, then it is assumed that I will act feminine, which is the gender performance, and desire men, which would be the heterosexual or the, the, you know, through the heterosexual matrix, the norm of what desire I should have. So this unity among biological sex, gender identification, and heterosexuality is not dictated by nature. It's really a cultural assumption that we've pressed upon people. So we get from Butler a very postmodern approach to feminism and understandings of queer theory. Okay, so looking at Butler's theoretical orientation, there's a non-rationalistic approach to action here, which is evident in Butler's theorizing of sex as a social construct, and that performances create subjectivities. So remember, again, not just gender, not just sexuality, but sex itself is a social construct. Why? Because there's more than just male and female, right? We know this. We know that some people are born intersexed. We know that some people have chromosomal conditions that cause, you know, where they'll have two X's and a Y chromosome or um, an extra Y, or we know that there's, you know, other conditions that, you know, hormonal fluxal conditions that cause other variations in what we consider a concrete biological binary. But we know that it's actually more than that, right? We actually, in this country, routinely force babies to go through unnecessary surgeries to their genitals to fit them to this false binary, right? And there's this research article I make students read in my sexualities class, and I can never get it out of my mind because this doctor that was interviewed that does these kind of surgeries, he was asked, you know, why, why are you doing this? <laughs> like, do the babies need these surgeries? No, they're medically unnecessary, but they're really to fit them into one category of male or female if they have any sort of ambiguous genitalia. And um, he said, the quote he said was, it's easier to fix the child than society. And that's just really, really disheartening, especially when you're talking about like hundreds to even thousands of children going through these kind of procedures every day. And why? To fit them into a binary. We know that there's more people that are born intersex than are born with cerebral palsy or with Down syndrome. Yet we know what cerebral palsy is. We know what Down syndrome is. But we pretty much all ignore the idea that intersexuality even exists, right? So even sex itself is a social construct. <clears throat> and yet when you challenge these things, it can really upset people because these are foundational principles upon all of our social organization is resting upon, right? So anyway, basically Butler's saying these kind of social constructs, sex, gender, sexuality, these construct the performances that we have in our, in our lives that then create subjectivities. So there's an emphasis on collective orientation within Butler's theoretical orientation. So this is reflected in their emphasis on the role of structured scripts or discourses and pre-existing symbolic patterns, right? Like you're coming into a culture that has these kind of gendered norms, but it's the ways in which we either take upon those scripts and perform them or we challenge them, or we kind of have discourse about what is appropriate, like what is a man, what is, what is a woman, right? These kind of things within society. And there's also individualistic elements that are apparent in Butler's insistence that regulatory norms and discourses are never wholly determining, and that subjectivities are formed in interaction. Again, so saying it's not as if you're just like, okay, yep, I am 100% a female now, that's it. But it's the idea that as we perform our gender with each other, as we perform our sexuality, as we have these kind of sites of discourse, that that actually helps determine what subjectivities we then have, right? Which, which kind of ways in which we inhabit or absorb the notions of society. But then we can, again, it can either be a site of, of taking on those things, or it can be a, a situation to challenge them, right? So 
if you decide to transgress against the expectations of those, you know, um, you know, social notions within your in interaction, you can actually often end up expanding the category or the notion of what is appropriate within those narrow confines of binaries, right? Or you can create the difference in yourself that is reflection of society and then end up reifying that social norm, right? So again, she's saying that it's really about how, you know, it's not fully just the norms in society or the discourses we're getting from others or from the culture, or from the institutions. It's also our specific interactions that we have. So that's where that comes, that individualism comes in. Okay, that's the wrap of the chapter, pretty quick. <laughs>